vacation this week, and it was truly the most marvelous. If you are in need of a vacation, take one. <laughs> All right, see you later. <laughs> You're not done yet. So, okay, uh, but what I found was on the way home, you're looking for a place to eat and you come to a place that says Chinese buffet. Well, that sounds good, let's go there. And you say, we're going there to have a bite to eat. We have a strange language because I must have had 300, 400 bites. Way too many bites, that's what happens at a buffet. But the best thing was the fortune that came out of the cookie. And the fortune said, he who is afraid to ask is ashamed of learning. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, there's nobody in unity that's afraid to ask, that's for sure, because we honor the questions. There's no ashamed for learning in this room either. Learning is good, that's what we're here for. So I want to go to the question because this is question time, and there was a question I started last week and I want to continue with that so we can put it to rest. But let me tell you, there's a lot to this. Here's the question. What is the role of angels, guides, fairies, and Jesus? If God is our source, why do some people pray to these others? Are there times when we pray to God and some other times when we pray to all the others? <laughs> wow, what is the role of angels, guides, fairies, and I'm going to take Jesus out of that category because I don't think he belongs in the same sentence with fairies. Somehow, <laughs> that just doesn't fit for me. So we'll get to Jesus later, if that's okay with everybody. All right, so angels, guides, and fairies, what is the role? Well, there's nothing written down anywhere that I have ever found, and plus rules I don't like anyway. So there aren't any rules, and you can believe whatever the role is for you, whatever you want it to be about angels, guides, and fairies. So where do our beliefs come from? Well, mine came from my childhood, my upbringing, and I was brought up in a strict religious way. It was pragmatic, it was logical, and guides and fairies? That was utter nonsense. There was no room for anything like that. Now, angels were a little bit different because we were told that angels were in the Bible and that's where they needed to stay. <laughs> don't think you're gonna bring angels into your life today because they don't fit. It's kind of like dreams. We were told dreams, that's Bible stuff, but don't bring them in your life today because they don't have any meaning for you. They only had meaning in biblical days. Hmm. Well, you see, we're not in a religion anymore. We've let go of the dogma, the creeds, the doctrine, the rules, and all of that. And unity is what we would call a spiritual way of life, in which there is no path that's laid down for us by someone, a path that we have to follow. Instead, we make our own path in spirituality. Oh yes, we have guidelines, guideposts, we could call them. These principles, the universal principles that we go by. And in unity, we have five of them, and they're found in many different religions of the world and faiths. But there's a lot of wiggle room in those principles. There is room for our uniqueness and for our beliefs. All different kinds of beliefs. So first of all, let's say, do I have to have this thing here? <laughs> Somehow, <coughs> I'm looking at that and I'm not seeing you. So if we could just take that to the side, that would really be nice. There were no rules. So there are no rules. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it. Thank you. Okay, so now that we're past that, I'm going to get to fairies. What's a fairy? <laughs> a fairy is a nature spirit. It's an entity that's helpful. And I love the idea of fairies. You know, just the way they look with their gossamer wings, and we have some of them out in the bookstore. I just, I have been 
so tempted to take one of them home, but I haven't done it yet. But I love fairies. Guides, what's a guide? It's an advanced being that guides us through this life in many different ways. It could be in this dimension or the next dimension. And as I said, we're going to leave Jesus for later. But how about an angel? What is an angel? We have many different ideas about angels. See, we tend to give them a form. So when I say the word angel, our mind thinks in pictures, and you picture a form dressed in white that has beautiful wings. And so I think we need to look at angels metaphysically also that goes beyond the form. But before I get to that, an angel, we have given them the power to interfere in our lives, a power that we don't even give to God. God can't set aside God's laws to do something for us and nobody else. The God that sits up in the sky, the God that isn't even there anymore, the God of the past century was the God that gave miracles to some and not to others. But that God, the one that is within us and all around us, is so different. This power and presence has given us everything. We already have it. We live in a kingdom of everything, every good thing. <clears throat> it's ours. And so what do we have in this kingdom? We have all the wisdom, the power, the strength, the guidance. We have, as the Bible says, in this power, we live and move and have our being. We're in it. We can't get out of it no matter what. No matter how hard we try, we are in this power. It gives us all the love we'll ever need. We already have that. It gives us all the faith we'll ever need. We already have that. It gives us the will to do or not to do. It gives us all these things, an imagination that is such a beautiful power that sometimes it just boggles my mind. It boggles my imagination that I have this power to use in this life. And yet, all we have to do is claim that. But it doesn't seem fair, does it? Because some have the awareness that all they have to do is claim it because it's already ours, and others do not have. And they will probably go to their grave and never have this awareness that all this has been given to us and all we have to do is claim it. Is that where angels come in? I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm going to let you decide a lot of this today. But we are going to look at angels metaphysically. An angel is a messenger of God. An angel is our highest thought, our highest idea that we can have that comes directly from God mind to our mind. And that idea comes in all its purity, in all its strength and power and love and light. That's an angel thought. It's in the 20th chapter of John. This is the Easter story. The Bible says that there are two angels dressed in white that are sitting at the feet and at the head of where the body of Jesus has lain. But the body is gone. The two angels are still there. These two angels, what do they mean to us? They are tools that we can use. They send us high thoughts. You see, the office of angels is to guide us, direct us, and to raise our consciousness, to raise our thinking from here to here. Angels can give us wings. And these two angels then, the one at the foot, what, you know what? 
They're at the tomb, so I think we have to do the tomb first. You see, this is what happens when you get to answer questions. And you get to look at something in the Bible where it's talking about this, but it's also talking about this. So, okay, let's go to the tomb. We think of a tomb where these angels sat. We think of a tomb as something dark, something we might not like. In fact, some people have said, oh, that's a bad place to be. I mean, Jesus could only be there three days. Must not be good. But it is good. A tomb is a place of high understanding in which there are hidden energies that are preparing us, preparing for a greater demonstration. And so it is a resting place, but it's also a quiet, active place. That's a tomb. Maybe it helps to think of a seed, that we put a seed into the ground, into the darkness. And a seed is like a tomb, that outer covering. And there are quiet energies that are working inside of that seed because it's getting ready to make a demonstration. And so at some point, the energies burst that outer covering of the seed wide open so that that little green shoot can come up and appear above the ground for a beautiful demonstration. Well, we're like that tomb, too, that's inside of us, this resting place where we are gathering energies. And angels, I believe, help us do that. They send us thoughts, high thoughts, in which we say, I'm going to improve, I'm going to be better, I'm going to be more successful in life, I'm going to see how much love I can give to life. All these things, we're gathering these energies so that we are able to go out into life and make a demonstration of good. So the tomb then had a stone in front of it, didn't it? And the stone was rolled away. And the stone represents limited thinking. Well, angels are there. The stone is gone. The body is gone. The old is past. And now we're ready for something new. So what the angels give us? We have two angel tools. One is denial. One is affirmation. Denial is at the feet. That's where the angel sits, at the feet. And this angel says to us that denial is the power that we have, that we are not giving power to things in our lives. I like the idea of feet, that we're walking a path in this life, and all the things that we encounter, some of them are tough. But denial says, but they have no power over you. Because you have a power inside of you that is greater than anything in this world. The angel that sits at the head <coughs> is affirmation. <coughs> The inspiring thought that we have, the highest thought we can have. And so our affirmations then are words of truth. We often use the I am, the highest truth we can of the inner Christ, the inner God. And those words are powerful that help us overcome. So that's the Easter story in essence, way early now. But it's all about angels. I have another example. Somehow I feel I have to talk really fast today. So <coughs> let me take a sip here. Exodus, the third chapter. Here's Moses. And the way the Bible says it is that there is an angel in the midst of this burning bush. An angel. There's a high thought there. It comes directly into Moses' mind. Now what he's doing is having an inner dialogue with himself. You ever had one of those? Well, there's this thing in front of me that I'm supposed to be doing. I can't do that. I mean, come on. I'm just this little person and I'm going to be able to do this thing? No. How am I going to do that? And the angel thought comes and says, but you can do that. And the 
words that come to Moses are, I can and I am that I am. I am. The God of me says, yes, I can. I am that. I am. Moses gets the message. He gets the confidence. He gets the wherewithal to go forward and go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. I am that I am. That's the angel message that he gets. I am that. Another example that I give you, and this is my last example, is Jacob. Jacob in the Bible story is asking for a higher understanding. Give me a higher understanding of life. So he goes to this place called Haran, which means higher understanding. And he goes there alone. This is one of the most important things that you can get from Bible stories. The people go alone. Sometimes we're asked, why don't we have periods, long silence periods in our Sunday service? Why don't we have that? because we're not alone. We're sitting in a group of people and there are distractions. Just because you're sitting here and you're feeling the presence of others or people are stirring and you're doing things and you're not alone. That's why Jesus said, go in your inner sanctuary and close the door to the outside world and to everybody and be alone. Because this is what Jacob did then. It's nighttime. He's going to go to sleep. So he takes a stone for a pillow. This is why we have to look at this metaphysically. A stone for a pillow. Now I have been in many hotels and motels <laughs> across this country, and I have noticed that pillows are a problem. Have you ever noticed that? Some of them are almost non-existent, like the ones that we just had on this little vacation. Where are they? They just sort of dissolve into nothing. And so you have to use two or three of them. And then there are those pillows that are like foam, and you try to put your head into it, and it just bounces off of it. So pillows can be a problem. But to take a stone for a pillow, you wouldn't get a wink of sleep. So metaphysically, again, the stone is our limited thinking. It's our earthly thoughts that keep us connected to things of this earth. Well, Jacob didn't want that. He knew that was in his mind, but he wanted something higher. So he had a dream, and he saw a ladder, a vertical ladder. And the steps on that ladder told him in his dream that there would be increased understanding. And there were angels ascending and descending on this ladder, which means that there is a constant stream, the circulation of divine ideas that come into our minds, that came into his mind. He was so aware that this was just the beginning of his understanding. But he had received something higher. So in the morning, he took that stone of limited understanding, and now to him it was a stepping stone. And he set it upright, and the Bible says he made a pillar of it. And he poured oil on it. He made it sacred, and he called it Bethel, which means house of God. To Jacob, in that moment, he was there with God, and he made a vow. And his vow was essentially this. God, you have given me everything. Everything. You have given me all that I need, all that I have asked for. And I give back to you a tenth of all I have. So in other words, he's saying, Thank you, Brad. Thank you, because you always take care of me. You always give me everything I need. And in gratitude, I give back a mere tenth. It's a beautiful story. Three examples of angels in the Bible. 
But have I changed your mind one little bit about angels? Probably not. And I don't want to. Because I think whatever we think about angels, it's sacred to us. It's our belief. If you change it, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. But here is part of this question. Do we pray to angels? Do we pray to guides and fairies? And my answer to that would be no. They might guide us and direct us, but we don't pray to them. We pray to the source. We pray to God. Now, how about Jesus? Do we pray to Jesus? Yes, some of us do, and that's fine. Myrtle Fillmore, the mother of unity. Imagine that Jesus was sitting in the chair opposite her when she did all her healing work, and she spoke with Jesus probably many, many hours. Is that prayer? It could be. But I don't know. We'd have to ask her. And that's impossible right now. It could have been. But let me ask you this. Because the question was interesting. It used the word to. Pray to God. Pray to Jesus. Do we pray to? Or do we pray to something else? Well, I say we pray to God, but the word to implies that it's me or you and something outside ourselves. It implies that I might not even, or you might not even be part of this something outside ourselves, but we're praying to. What do we think about that? If we believe that we are a part of this power we call God, that it fills all time and space, that it is the only power there is. And as the Bible says, we live in it, can't get out of it, we're it. And who are we praying to? Am I praying to me? Are you praying to you? What is this? So we have different ways of praying. And I'm going to say right here that there is no wrong way to pray. I think whatever sincere prayer is said, it's a good prayer. And an angel prayer to me would be that it would take us from this place here where, God, I need help. And it lifts us to another place. So we have different kinds of prayer. It was the Jewish theologian Martin Buber who said, this is an I thou prayer. It's me here praying. To thou, to you, God. We use this form of prayer all the time. Silent Unity uses it. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore used it. We use it right today in the Daily Word. It's a beautiful form of prayer. But to me, the I thou prayer is like I'm praying from the part of me that understands what I am and what I'm a part of. But I'm also praying, too, that something of me that doesn't understand, that goes way beyond my understanding. So I take some of this from Dr. Tom Shepard. He writes for Unity Magazine. And he was in my classes when I was going to Unity Village 25 years ago or so. And Tom Shepard would sit in those classes and here I am, concentrating so hard on what the teacher is saying and what he's doing. He's doodling. He's sitting there and he's thumbing through a book and looking up this and that. But <clears throat> when the teacher calls on me, <laughs> you're going to be surprised. Well, the teacher did call on him. And the answer he gave was profound. It was brilliant. He's a brilliant guy. He knows how to do all these things. I didn't. But I take a lot of understanding from him. And he says, you know what? I think we need to get used to the contradiction in prayer that unity has. We need to be, get used to this dualistic prayer, that it is me and it is God. 
but he said there is a strong vein of something that also runs through unity, and it is affirmative prayer. It's centering prayer. You get that from the Catholics. It's a centering prayer. It's so beautiful. And the prayer in the silence. And we say nothing. We are just there. We are just being. We use all kinds of prayer. Silent unity does, and so do the Fillmore's, and so do we. So what I know is that the prayer of thanksgiving is a primal prayer. It's the most important prayer to me. Probably 50 times a day, thank you, thank you, Spirit, that I can go out and stand under the night sky and see what's there. I stand in awe of what is there. And I say thank you, thank you. Who am I saying thank you to? I'm saying thank you to the divine something that I don't understand something that has created all this that gives us all this. I say thank you for my life and for the joy and the life and the light, all that that is mine. Do I understand that? Do I know who I'm saying thank you to? It doesn't matter. Thank you is the most important prayer we can ever pray. And here's something else I know. That I have a good conversation going with spirit, and I intend to keep it going all my life. And I thou prayer, me here and God there, spirit there, I don't care. It's a conversation I need to have. So here's my recommendation. Pray to the God of unity. Pray to. Pray from the high consciousness that you have been given. Pray as the God of your being. Pray the I am prayer. Pray the centering prayer. Pray in the silence. Do it all. You know, there is no prayer police that's looking to strike you or some way punish you because you're praying wrong. Not. Whatever kind of prayer you pray that is right for you, do it. And here's what I know for sure. That the God, the presence and power that fills this universe will be there for you every step of the way. 